بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. So it's been a few weeks, but if we remember, we we had uh, introduction to the book and to the author, and we actually read, if I'm not mistaken, we read the introduction, uh, the author's introduction. Yeah, we did that, and remember I said that. The book of the Shifa is a book that is usually read with intentions, and my homework for everyone was to, on your you know you don't have to share that out loud, but for everyone to remember the intention. In addition to that, we read this with the intention of you know Allah blessing our mosque and our community. Everyone should have their own individual intentions, inshallah, for reading this book, and hopefully through the recital of this book and the reading and the teaching of this book, inshallah, Allah Taala will answer those du'a. So let us begin where we left off. قَالَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَنَفَعْنَا بِعُلُومِهِ فِي الدَّارَيْنِ آمِينَ Introduction. So Qadi Ayad, he says, it cannot be hidden from anyone who applies himself to the least study or who has been given the smallest gleam of understanding that Allah Ta'ala greatly esteems our Prophet وسلم, and has endowed him with virtues, excellent qualities, fine traits, too numerous to be counted. Doing any kind of justice to his immense worth would wear out both tongues and pens. And this is one of the ways that the Prophet Sassam is described in our literature as his praise cannot be exhausted. And this is um, th this, that concept in and of itself essentially is a summary of this entire book that you cannot exhaust how much you can praise and honor the Prophet. Allah's high estimation of his messenger can be partly seen from what is clearly stated in his book, meaning the Qur'an, about his exalted position. He has praised him in it from his character and his conduct, and he has encouraged the slaves of Allah, meaning us, to hold fast to him and obey what he imposed on them. Allah Ta'ala is the one who bestowed honor and preference on him, and then praised him and rewarded him for it with the fullest reward. Allah Ta'ala is overwhelmingly bountiful in the beginning and in the return, and to him belongs all praise in this world and the next. Further instances of Allah's high estimation of him can be seen in his presenting him before the eyes of his creatures in the most complete form of perfection and sublimity. So one of the Prophet's traits, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that physically he is the perfection of the human form. And we refer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Islam as al-insan al-kamil, the complete human being, meaning the complete person, meaning abstract of gender, he is the complete person. And in his physical features, Sallallahu as he will come to discuss later, he is the perfection of the physical form, as well as his internal qualities, of course. Uh, and his dis distinguishing him with beautiful qualities, praiseworthy characteristics, noble opinions, and numerous virtues. He supported him with dazzling miracles, over a thousand miracles the Alamat enumerated, clear proofs, and manifest signs of honor. These were witnessed by his contemporaries and companions and those who came after him knew about them with certain knowledge so that the knowledge of the reality of them has reached us and their light has overflowed on us. May Allah Ta'ala bless him and grant him peace abundantly, Amin. Anas narrates that on the night of the Isra and Ma'raj, the Buraq was brought, bridled and saddled to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the evening of the night journey it, sh it shied away from the Prophet because the Buraq had not been ridden since the time of Abraham alayhi salam. And between Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi salam is, who knows, thousands of years. So he's kind of like rusty. So he shied away from the Prophet alayhi salam. So maybe that's not the best translation. The hadith is not shied away. It's more... عن أنس أن النبي أوتي بالبلاء الأسرة ملجمن فاستصعب عليه. So he was being difficult. So the burak was being feisty, like the horse that bucks. And because the burak is like a horse, the horse that that bucks. So Gabriel says to to the burak, he says, "Do you do this with Muhammad?" So upon hearing the name Muhammad, no one more. The burak started to sweat. And Gabriel says, no one more honored by Allah 
has ever ridden you. Anas related that the burakh upon this broke out in a sweat. It's a hadith that is sahih. Okay, chapter one. Allah's praise of the Prophet ﷺ and his esteem for him. This chapter is an exposition of some of the clearest verses in the Qur'an which speak well of the Prophet ﷺ, enumerate his good qualities and Allah's esteem of him and praise of him. Okay, so basically in this chapter, we are going to go through some verses in the Qur'an and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has 10 sections, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed the Prophet ﷺ through these verses. Some of these verses will be obvious. Some of them hopefully will be new to you or new to us in hearing that these are verses that actually refer to the Prophet Wasallam, which is the whole point of the book. Allah Ta'ala, uh, section one concerning praise of him and his numerous excellent qualities. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, a messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ You will find in the footnote of the book of the translation, but it's actually part of the text, that there is another recitation of this verse in the non-canonical recitations. In the Qur'an, we have 10 canonical recitations. These, rec these 10 recitations are narrated through chains of transmission that are mutawatir, that they are uh, greatly transmitted, and it is permissible for us from an ibadah point of view, to stand in prayer and to recite the prayer with one of these 10 recitations. There are other recitations that are not at that level. And we call them al-qira'at al-shadha. We call them uh, non-canonical recitations. The non-canonical recitations, we treat them as hadith that are unitarily transmitted, what are called a hadith ahad. So if a hadith text has one chain of transmission or like two chains of transmission, we say it's a singular hadith. But if a hadith, 20 people narrated that hadith, we say that that's mutawatir, it's higher, a higher level. Most of the miracles of the Prophet are narrated through tawatir because they happen in public. So something happened in the mosque and everybody saw them. So each of these people, they go and narrate. So for us to be able to recite the Quran in prayer, it has to be one of those 10. But there are others that are not. So what do we do with them? We treat them as a form of tafsir. So in this Qadi Ayat, he says, there's another non-canonical recitation. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنْفَسِكُمْ Not مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ from you. As is translated, مِنْ أَنْفَسِكُمْ from the most pure amongst you. And nafis, a shay'un nafis, something that is nafis is something that is unique. She translates it as from the most precious amongst you. Okay, so that would be an added commentary. Just wanted to explain that so you know what's going on. Allah informs the believers or the Arabs or the people of Mecca or all people according to different commentaries on the meanings of these words that Allah Ta'ala has sent to them from amongst themselves a messenger whom they know. The Prophet Sallallahu was not an unknown entity. He was known. His family was known. His lineage was known. Whose position they are sure of and whose truthfulness and trustworthiness they cannot but recognize. Everyone recognized the honesty of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone, even his enemies, recognized his honesty. Therefore, since he is one of them, they should not suspect him of lying or of not giving them good counsel. There is no Arab tribe without descent from or kinship with the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. This is according to Ibn Abbas and others, is the meaning of the words except love, for kin, illa al fil rahma. He is from the noblest, highest, and most excellent of them. How much further in the verse can praise go? So the Prophet Sallallahu is a descendant of Ismail. Ismail was not an Arab, but uh, he was adopted by the Arab, the, the Arab tribe of Jurham, and he married into them. So there are the original Arabs, well, there are the extinct Arabs, the Arabs of Thamud and Ad, those are extinct. And then after the extinction of those ancient Arabs, there are the uh, Arab, uh, the original Arabs, what's the right word in English? I can't remember right now. al arab al ariba the Arabi, no, they're the original Arabs. And then there are the Arabized Arabs. Those are the descendants of Ismail and Jurhum from which comes the Prophet 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Ismail learned Arabic and learned the, the ways of the Arabs from his marriage and growing up in Mecca because he was an infant, of course. The Prophet sallallahu descends from that line. And because of that, he is basically connected his, the tribe of Quraysh, the, the family of Hashim, they're all connected to all of these other tribes. So this is of the, in the Arab space at that time, he was known. And Allah Ta'ala also tells us regarding the other prophets that he always sends a prophet from those people. That's one of the signs of prophecy or why, you know, they agitated because he was one of them. He came from that community. Then Allah Ta'ala continues the verse by attributing to him all kinds of praiseworthy qualities and greatly praises his eagerness to guide people to Islam, his deep concern for the intensity of what afflicts and harms them in this world and the next and his compassion and mercy for the believers. One of the men of knowledge, al Hussein ibn Fadl said, he honored him with two of his own names, compassionate and merciful, Ra'ufun Rahim. So one of the praiseworthy traits of the Prophet Sallallahu is he has some of Allah's names. Now they mean something different for the Prophet as they mean for Allah Ta'ala, but he shares some of those names. The same point is made in another verse. Allah was kind to the believers when he sent amongst them a messenger from amongst themselves. Another verse says he is the one who sent a messenger from you amongst the unlettered people. Allah Ta'ala also says he sent amongst you a messenger from you. It is related that Imam Ali alayhi salam said that the words of Allah from amongst yourselves means by lineage, relationship, by marriage, and descent. There was no fornicator amongst his forefathers. From the time of Adam, all of them were properly married. And this is a very important uh, point of our belief, is that the lineage of the Prophet Sassam, all the way back to Adam and Eve is pure. Because there are some people, uh, even in, in the pre-modern world, there were some Muslim ulama who messed, messed this up and, and argued that, the parents of the Prophet ﷺ were disbelievers and whatnot. So it's not just a Salafi Wahhabi thing, but for some reason, this is one of their big points. That's completely incorrect. Ibn, Ab, uh, Ibn al Kalbi uh, said, I wrote down 500 female ancestors of the Prophet, ﷺ, and I did not find any fornication amongst them, nor any of the evils which were prevalent in the Jahiliya period. Ibn Abbas said that the words of Allah, when you turn, amongst those who prostrate this means from prophet to prophet until I brought you out as a prophet so this verse and this is the tafsir that's accepted of this verse is proof that all of the parents, ancestors of the prophet even though we don't know beyond Ismail back up we don't know with certainty uh, and there are some ulama that tried to write them all out but we, they're not accepted we only know with certainty from the Prophet Sassam to Sidna Ismail. But from Ismail all the way back to Adam and Eve, there is no fornication, there is no ideal, idolatry, there is no um, uh, shirk involved in that lineage. Now, why is this also important? Because this also helps us understand another verse in the Quran when we talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam talking with his father. And many Muslims, and, and there are even amongst the ulama, unfortunately, of tafsir, they will say that this was Abraham's father. But if we just agree, which the ulama do, that there is no polytheism in the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu then therefore that verse must mean something else. So that verse is Abraham talking to his uncle, calling him father out of respect. So on and so forth. So you'll find a lot of these corrections. And usually during the month of Ramadan, I try to point these things out when we do our uh, daily khatiras. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said, Allah knew that his creatures would not be capable of pure obedience to him. So he told them in order that they would realize that they would never be able to achieve absolute purity in serving him. Between himself and them, he placed one of their own species, clothing him in his own attributes of compassion and mercy. He brought him out as a truthful ambassador to creation and made it such that when someone obeys him, they are obeying Allah. And when someone agrees with him, they are agreeing with Allah. Allah Ta'ala says, whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. Allah Ta'ala also says, we do not send you except as a mercy to all of the worlds. We know this verse. Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Tahir said in explanation of this verse, Allah imbued Muhammad Sassam with mercy. 
so that his very being was mercy, and all his qualities and attributes were mercy to all creatures. Whoever is touched by any aspect of his mercy is saved in both worlds from every hateful thing and obtains everything he loves. Do you not see that Allah Ta'ala says, we did not send you except as a mercy to all the worlds? His life was a mercy and his death was a mercy. As the Prophet Sallallahu himself said, my life is a blessing for you and my death is a blessing for you. The Prophet also said, والسلام, when Allah desires mercy for a community, he takes its prophet to him before them and he makes him one who goes ahead to prepare the way for them. As Samarqandi explains that the words a mercy to all worlds mean both the jinn and mankind. It is also said that it means for all creation. He is a mercy to the believers by guiding them, a mercy to the hypocrites by granting them security from being killed, and a mercy to the unbelievers by deferring their punishment. Ibn Abbas said he is a mercy to the believers and also to the unbelievers since they are saved from what befell the other communities who cried lies. It is related that the Prophet said to Jibreel, has any of this mercy touched you? Gabriel replied, yes, I used to have fear about what would happen to me, but now I feel safe because of the way Allah praised me when he said, securely placed with the Lord of the throne, obeyed there, trustworthy. It is related that Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said that the words of Allah Ta'ala, peace be upon you from the companions of the right, mean because of you, Muhammad Sallallahu The cause of their peace is the high honor bestowed upon the Prophet Sallallahu Allah Ta'ala also says, Allah, the verse of light, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allahu nuru samawati al The likeness of his light is that of a niche in which there is a lamp, the lamp inside a glass, the glass like a brilliant star, lit from a blessed tree, an olive, neither of the east nor the west, it's oil all but giving off light, even if no fire touches it. Light upon light, Allah guides to his light anyone who wills, and Allah makes likeness for mankind, and Allah has knowledge of everything. Kaab al Ahbar and Ibn Jubair said, by the second light, he means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says the likeness of his light, meaning the light of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And usually, with very few exceptions, all references to light in the Qur'an are references to the Prophet wasallam, as he will explain now. Sahil ibn Abdullah al-Tustari said that it means that Allah is the guide of the people of the heavens and the earth. Then Sahil said, like the light of Muhammad wasallam, when it is lodged in the loins like a niche, by the lamp he means his heart, the glass is his breast. It is as if it was a brilliant star because of the belief and wisdom it contains, lit from a blessed tree, that is, from the light of Ibrahim salam. He makes comparison with the blessed tree, and he says it's oil, all but giving off light. That is, Muhammad's prophethood is almost evident to the people before he speaks, just like this oil. A lot more is said about this verse, and Allah knows best what it means. I mean, if we just dedicated the rest of the year, we could talk about that verse. Elsewhere in the Qur'an, Allah calls His Prophet a light and a light-giving lamp. He says, a light and a clear book have come to you from Allah. Allah Ta'ala also says, we sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news and a warner, one who calls to Allah with His permission and a light-giving lamp, wa sirajan unira. So here, Qadi Ayad is going to defend the, basically the tafsir of the verse of light by showing you other verses how the Prophet is referred to as a light. This is why Allah says, Did we not expand your breast for you? Alam nashrah laka sadrak. To expand, sharaha, is to make wide and vast. By the word breast, Allah here means the heart. Ibn Abbas said he expanded it with the light of Islam. Sahl al Tustari said, With the light of the message. Hassan al Basri said he filled it with judgment and knowledge. It is also said that it means that we not purify your heart so that it does not allow in any whisperings from shaitan. The surah continues, and we lifted your burden from you, the burden that weighed down your back. It is said that this means his wrong actions, that is from the time before he was a prophet. It is said that it means the burden of the days of Jahiliyyah. It is said that the meaning is the message which weighed down his back before he conveyed it, and this is the opinion of al-Mawardi and al-Sulami. It, also, it is also said that it means we protected you and if we had not been, and if had we not been, sorry, 
And if it had not been for that, wrong actions would have burdened your back. And this is what Al-Sam Al-Qandi narrates. So this is a typical way that Imam uh, or the Qadi Ayad writes. It is said, it is said, this is a way of the ulama quoting the people before him. So-and-so said this about this verse. And it's also said this, this, and all of them are congruently acceptable uh, tafsirs or ex acceptable explanations unless he points out that there's a problem. So we, we would never say, for example, that there's only one tafsir of a verse, right? Because the verses are never ending in meaning. Okay, the surah continues. Did we not raise higher renown? Yahya ibn Adam said that this meant uh, by giving him prophethood. It is said that the meaning of these words is explained in the hadith Qudsi. When I am mentioned, you are mentioned with me in the statement. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu it is also said the same is done by the means of the adhan. So when Allah Ta'ala says, We have caused your remembrance to be known. Think of all of the things that cause us to remember the Prophet Sallallahu There's no adhan or no iqama or no prayer except that we mention Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no Islam unless we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this alone shows us the honor that Allah Ta'ala has given and the, the rank that Allah has given his Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam. What is clear is that these words Allah confirm, by these words Allah confirms the immensity of the favor he has bestowed upon the Prophet, his noble station with him and the honor in which he holds him. He expanded his breast to belief and guidance and made it wide enough to contain knowledge and bear wisdom. He removed from him the burdens of all things of the Jahiliyyah and made their pursuance hateful to him by giving victory to his deen over all other deens. So the Prophet ﷺ never partook in anything of the Jahiliyyah. Whatever was in the time of the Jahiliyyah, from false beliefs, false practices, uh, social conduct that we would consider non-Islamic, the Prophet ﷺ never participated or did any of that, ever, before he was commissioned. Allah Ta'ala has protected him from that. And this is also a common misconception that Muslims have as well, when they talk about the seerah or the life of the Prophet they, they somehow forget about the first 40 years. And the first 40 years, well, the majority of the Prophet's life, before he was commissioned, he was still for us an example. So when Allah Ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verily in the Messenger of Allah is an example for you, that means all of him. It's not just like the last 10 days of his life or when he went to Medina and we forget about Mecca or when he was commissioned and we forget about what happened before. No, we, we, we look at from the time he was born, alayhi salatu salam, we draw lessons from his life. Allah Ta'ala uh, lightened for him the weighty responsibility of the message and prophethood so he could convey to people what was sent down to him. He re-emphasized the sublime position, majestic rank, high renown of his prophet, and joined his name with his own. The greatest example of this is the hadith that Hakim narrates that when, the, uh, that when Adam السلام, and Eve ate from the tree, Adam min kalimatin So Adam sought words of tawbah from Allah and Allah forgave him. When you read the tafsir of that verse, what did Adam say that, that allowed Allah Ta'ala to forgive him? Adam said, I ask you, Ya Allah, by Muhammad that you forgive me. So Allah Ta'ala asked him, how do you know this name Muhammad? And he said, when you blew the soul into my body, I saw that it was written on your throne, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I know that you do not mention your name except that you mention his name. To which Allah Ta'ala replied, this is true and it is because of him that I created you. So when he says that Allah Ta'ala has joined the Prophet's name to Allah's name, you know, this is a deep, deep meaning. Qatada said, Allah Ta'ala exalted his fame in this world and the next. There is no speaker, witness, nor anyone doing the prayer who fails to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And of course, this book was written a long time ago, so Qadi Ayat didn't know about Ahmed T and didn't know about Mo Salah 
and all of these examples that I always say, but these are also examples of how Allah has caused the Prophet's name to be mentioned. I mean, what's the, you know, what's one of the most famous tea brands that we all drink? You know, Ahmed tea. That's one of the Prophet's names. I don't even know who's behind it, right? But Ahmed T, everyone knows that name. Or in the world of sports, everyone knows Muhammad Salah or Mo Salah or something like that. Again, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Muhammad Ali, the boxer, right? I mean, for people, us that are a little bit older, that was like the one thing we had going when we were growing up. Or at least there's a, you know, Muhammad Ali, the boxer. He could have been named, you know, like Abdul Hakim Jabbar or something like that. But no, he, he was Muhammad Ali, right? Considered the greatest athlete of all time in any sport, so on and so forth. These are all ways that Allah has caused the Prophet's name to be high and to be exalted. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri related that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Gabriel salam, came to me and said, My Lord and your Lord says, Do you know how I have exalted your fame? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. And he said, When I am mentioned, you are mentioned with me. Ibn Atta quoted a hadith Qudsi saying, I complete completed belief with your being mentioned with me. And another one which says, I have made your mention part of my mention, so whoever mentions me, mentions you. One of the things that you will find if you uh, look at extreme Muslim uh, rhetoric, which I don't want any of you to do, but I have to do a lot of, is that they they don't mention the Prophet's name almost at all, which is, which is it's just an amazing sign None of us would ever think of mentioning Allah's name without the Prophet's name, ever. But people, when you find somebody, uh, some of these extreme people uh, that you know, I've looked at, like the people in like Nigeria and, and Boko Haram, these other people, they almost refer to themselves as God. And they never, I, I can't, hardly they mention the Prophet's name. And if they mention the Prophet's name, they mention like, they'll say like Muhammad, like some guy like down the street. Whereas when we mention his name, we know we say the messenger of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, or something like that. So that's something, you know, these are all signs for us to think of. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said, no one mentions you as the messenger, but that he mentions me as the Lord. Some of the people of knowledge, such as Al-Mawardi, suggested that the station of intercession was being referred to by this. The fact that mention of the Prophet is directly connected to mention of Allah also shows that obedience to the Prophet is connected to obedience of Allah and his name to Allah's name. Allah Ta'ala says, obey Allah and, the mess and his messenger. Atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul. And believe in Allah and his messenger. Allah joins them together using the conjunction wa, which is the conjunction of partnership. So believe in Allah as well as the Prophet. Obey Allah as well as the Prophet It is not permitted to use this conjunction in connection with Allah in the case of anyone except the Prophet Excuse me. Hudayfa. Hudayfa said that the Prophet وسلم, said, none of you should say what Allah wills and so and so wills, using the conjunction wow. Rather say Allah wills, then stop and say so and so wills. Meaning that you can't, there's no, you know, la sharika la, there's no partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the only exception when we would use that conjunction in speech is when we refer to the Prophet not that the Prophet is an associate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course we don't believe that, but that is honoring the rank of the Prophet Al-Khattabi said that the Prophet وسلم, was guided, uh, sorry, the Prophet has guided you to correct behavior and putting the will of Allah before the will of others. He chose then, thumma, which applies sequence and deference as opposed to and, wow, which implies partnership. Something similar is mentioned in another hadith. Someone was speaking in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and he said, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has been rightly guided. Whoever rebels against them both, joining them together by using the dual form, the Prophet said to him, what a bad speaker you are, get up or get out, because of the misspeaking and its implication. Abu Sulaiman said he disliked the two names being joined together in that, that way because it implies equality. Someone else thought 
that what he disliked was stopping at whoever rebels against us. Abu Sulaiman's statement is sounder since it is related to another sound recension of the hadith that he said, whoever rebels against them has erred without stopping after whoever rebels against them. Well, this is going to be a little bit lost because of the translation. Uh, so the hadith, the man was saying, whoever obeys Allah and his prophet has done right, and whoever disobeys both of them, and he stopped. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to, that don't stop there as if I am equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, we don't need to dwell on that. The commentators and etymologists disagree regarding the words of Allah. Allah and his angels pray blessings on the Prophet. Inna Allahu malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. And this is a verse that has a lot of commentary on it. About whether the word pray refers to both Allah and the angels or not. Because Allah doesn't pray. So when the verse says Allah and the angels pray, well, that, there's some, you can't say that even as a translation because that's not what the, Allah doesn't pray. We, pray. we pray to Allah. So what is the salat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what is the salat of the angels? That's where the discussion of the verse is. Some of them allow, some of the ulama allow it to refer to both, while others forbid this because of the idea of partnership. They make the pronoun refer to the angels alone and understand the verse as Allah prays and his angels pray. It is related, the basic understanding of the verse is that the salat of Allah referred to here is Allah's rahmah, mercy is upon the Prophet. It is related that Umar radiallahu anhu said to the Prophet, ﷺ, part of your excellence with Allah is that he has made obedience to you, obedience to him. Allah Ta'ala says, whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. And if you love Allah, then follow me and Allah will love you. It is related that when this verse was revealed, people said, Muhammad wants us to take him as a mercy in the way that the Christians did with Christ. So Allah Ta'ala revealed, obey Allah and the Messenger. Allah connected obedience to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with obedience to himself in spite of what people said. This idea of obedience to the Prophet Sallallahu dispels the Qur'an only people. You know the Qur'an only, every family has an uncle that's a Qur'an only uncle, right? That just, let's forget about the hadith and only stick with the Qur'an. I mean, I say that jokingly, but it's probably true. I mean, I know I have them too in my family. Right, this, clearly these last two, three pages, we know that that's not going to work, right? There's no Islam without la ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah Wasallam. But this was actually a discussion in the early generations when the ulama were codifying Islamic law and jurisprudence and all of that. Uh, somebody like Imam Shafi, radiallahu anhu, who was the first person to actually write down the rules of Islamic jurisprudence, this was a question that he actually had an answer, is where is our authority? Is it just in the Qur'an, or is it in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet, And these type of verses, of course, this book, is purpose of this book is it's not a legal book, this is different. This is to show us how to, we interact with the Prophet, but from the, I'm just giving you this tangent because the same verses are used. It is very clear that we have to obey both Allah and the Prophet So we have to take our deen from the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet The reason we have the Quran only people is because the hadith is more complicated to understand than the Quran. And there are all of these narrations and there are all of these collections and some of them are strong and some of them are weak and some of them are forged. That's the problem. It's, it's really intellectual laziness. No, no Muslim is going to say we're not going to follow the Qur'an. I mean, I mean, maybe they do, but then they'll just leave Islam that way. But when the Qur'an is, you know, finite, 6,236 verses, there's no versions of the Qur'an. Okay, that's fine. But when it comes to the hadith, 
Well, what hadith? Where do we find them? Well, Bukhari was just a man. Well, Bukhari didn't write the hadith until several hundred years after the Prophet, so on and so forth. You hear these type of things. And it's really a type of intellectual laziness. One of the things that's beneficial about this book, and I mentioned in the beginning, the first class, is that Qadi Ayyad himself was a hadith master. So he's not really going to include in this book anything that is dubious. The commentators disagree about the meaning of the words of God in the Fatiha, Ihdina Salat al Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path, the path for those you are blessed. Abu Aliyah. Sometimes I can't, I don't know the, the Arabic from the English. Abu Aliyah um, and Hassan al Basri said that the straight path is the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of the people of his house and his companions. Right? So the Sirat al Mustaqim in this tafsir is following the way of the Prophet, وسلم, the family of the Prophet, the Al Bayt, and the companions, which is basically the Sunni understanding uh, that we have. Uh, al Hassan al Mawardi related from Abu al Aliya and Al Hassan al Basri that the straight path. Is the messenger of Allah and the best of the people of his house and his companions. Mecca related something similar. This refers to the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa his two companions, Abu Bakr and Umar. May Allah be pleased with them both. Of course, we take from all of the Sahaba, not just those two. Abu Layth al related almost the same from Abu Ali regarding the words of Allah, the path of those whom you have blessed. Uh, also from Al Fatiha. Hassan al Basri heard it and said, It is true by Allah and it is a good counsel. Al Mawardi relates this in his commentary on the words, the path of those whom you are blessed from Abu Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd. Abu Abdul Rahman al Sunami related that one of the commentators said that in the words of Allah Ta'ala, he has taken hold of the firmest handle. Sometimes when I read the translation, I don't know what verse it is. فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَةِ The firmest handle is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is also said that it means Islam. As a religion, it is also said that it means the testimony of Tawheed. Right? So all of these, it doesn't mean that one is right and all the others are wrong, but they are concurrently correct. Sahih al-Tustari said that the words of Allah, if you were to count the blessings of Allah, you will not be able to number, enumerate them. وَإِن تَعُدُّ نَامَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا refers to particularly to the blessing of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, he who brings the truth and he who confirms it, such are the God-fearing. Most of the commentators say that the one who brought the truth is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of them said he is the one who confirmed it. Sometimes the word is read as sadaqa, spoke the truth, sometimes sadaqa or confirmed it. That is referring to the believers. It is said that Abu Bakr is meant and it is said that it refers to Ali. And other things are said as well. Um, okay. Mujahid said that the words of Allah, hearts are stilled by the remembrance of Allah. Allah refers to the Prophet. And his companions. Okay, so you can see already the immense amount of references to the Prophet ﷺ in the Quran, maybe in verses that we didn't think about that are references to the Prophet. ﷺ. Should I keep going or do we should we stop for questions? Or are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's asking for Allah's rahmah on the Prophet ﷺ. In this verse, it, the verse means Allah's sending His mercy on the Prophet ﷺ. This is the first time we listen from you, Abu, that Adam ﷺ speaks Allah's forgiveness on the name of our Prophet. <laughs> that we have, all the time we have listened that uh, Adam like, not on the name of... Yeah, this is a hadith that's related by Hakim. By Imam Hakim. 
And Imam al-Busiri in the Burda, he says, he says that, he says, وَكَيْفَ تَدْعُوا إِلَى الدُّنْيَا دَرُورَةُ مَنْ لَوْ لَهُ لَمْ تَخْرُجِ الدُّنْيَا مِنْ عَدَمِ How can you explain to the world the necessity of the Prophet ﷺ? For without him, this whole world would not have been created. This is a reference to this hadith of Hakim. That when Allah Ta'ala says he is the best of your descendants, and it is because of him I created you. So our belief in Rasulullah Sallallahu is deeper than uh, he's a prophet the way all of the other prophets were prophets because we believe that he was the first in creation of the Anbiya. And then that nur of the Prophet Sallallahu was placed into the progeny of Adam Alayhi salam. So when Allah Ta'ala says, وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ You being... Yani your genetic, we, we would say, your genetic material is passed from one pious person to another, but that genetic material was created first and then placed in Adam alayhi salam. So the Prophet sallam, is big, is great, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of the NBA knew about Sayyidina Muhammad. That's our belief that they all told their people about Sayyidina Muhammad sallam. Did you have something? That's an interesting way to start a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the significance of being a Sayyid is that you are a lineal descendant of the Prophet from the children of Fatima and uh, Imam Ali alayhi masalam. I mean, it's a it's a dunya, and it has, uh, inshallah, salvatory uh, benefit. Yom al Qiyama, the Prophet sallallahu he said, Yom al Qiyama yan qata'a kullu sababim wa nasab illa sababi wa nasabi. On the day of judgment, all links and all lineage will be separate, except links to me and lineage to me, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that we hope that by studying this and with our direct chain of transmission, may this be our link to the Prophet sallallahu Inshallah, it will save us. Yom al Qiyamah. But the Sada or the Al Bayt is something that happens after the, after the, the Prophet Sassam had children. This is separate from the issue of he was, you know, passed, etc. No. No. Can you clarify? Because then you went back to uh, Ibrahim and Islam, and then you said that because we're, I think, this, we understand that you know his father was the one who did the you know idolatry and all that stuff like that, and he tried to he tried to correct his father. So you're saying that that wasn't his father; that was his uncle. Yes, that was his uncle because okay. is uh, Abraham is the father of Ismail, right? And Ismail is is a, a, a grandparent of the Prophet Isaac. Right, right. So, so therefore, to reconcile these two, there must be another meaning to that verse. There are, unfortunately, many uh, Quranic uh, uh, commentators that will still just, you know, pass that on and say, yeah, this was Abraham's father. Because I feel like, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like that's the most um, popular it is. That yeah, And people get very mad when I say that, just as mad when I talk about Christ on Christmas Day. Uh, yeah, so okay. I don't know why there's. I, I find it very interesting what get people excited. God. Like, no, he had to be a disbeliever. I'm like, okay, I knew. Right, no, because I've heard that before. First of all, this has no effect in our day to day practice of Islam. Mm -hmm. Right, these are points of belief. So, well, I'm just saying it for the people that will listen and get super excited about what I just said. But the the, the fact of the matter is that it's an incorrect uh, comment. It's an incorrect understanding of the verse. So who was Ibrahim Islam? Where was his father? Did he pass or something? Or is it the verse refers to his uncle and that it was typical at that time that he would refer or he referred to his uncle as my father as a term of endearment. Right. Okay. So where was his father in his life, I guess? I don't I don't know. We just don't know that information. No, I don't know. Oh, okay. I do. I'm yeah. sure that information is there. I just don't gotcha. know that. Right. Okay. Right. That's it. Mm. I had one question. It's not directly related to the text, though. 
Um, and then I also had another question building off of his. So in Arabic, um, Ab can also refer to a paternal uncle or grandfather, correct? That's that's just from what I've heard, and I just wanted to confirm that. Not linguistically, but you can refer to your uncle as uh, uh, with that term out of respect. Just like if I met some, like a woman, an older woman, I would call her Khala. Khala means my mother's sister. Well, she's not all, all these women are not my mother's sister, but out of respect, I call her Khala. Or if I see a, an older man, I would call him Ammu, my father's, which literally means my father's brother. It's out of respect. So it's the same kind of concept. And then the second question was, uh, see the um, Muhammad ibn Jafar al-Kittani, he narrates a hadith. And I believe some of them are taken from the Mustadak of Hakim. I'm not 100% sure. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions his intercession for um, the people of his household. Does this refer to particular Sayyids or anybody who comes from the lineage? To anyone who's a descendant, like the hadith I just narrated, al kullu wa nasab illa sababi wa nasab. Okay. So it's a, it's a sound hadith. And Abdullah bin Sadiq al ghumari quotes, uh, narrates the hadith with his full chain in, in one of his books about praising the Prophet. So there's a sound hadith. And that type of intercession is there, but the Prophet has intercession for other people. So being connected, I mean, one of the reasons why we're so concerned by passing these along these chains of transmission and seeking these chains of transmissions from our teachers and passing them on to our community is for this reason, because then we have a link that directs us back to the Prophet. So that's very, very important because then you will be included in that as well. Uh, okay, Brother Mohsen, and then the questions online. I guess we're going to stop. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, praising the Prophet, I'd like to draw your attention to the inscription on top mm. and ask you to comment. Maybe you so that's the verse that we were just reading. Yeah, you ladina amenu. Sorry, in the law, mala ekata, you saluna ala nabiya, you ladina amenu, salu alayhi, was salimu taslima. That's the verse that we were just reading about uh, the prayers on the Prophet. So that's an obligation, you know, Allah Ta'ala tells us to do that. So doing salawat on the Prophet is a form of ibadah, and he's we just read a couple of pages ago. Uh, when he commented on the verse, Allah bi dhikri lahi tatmin al qulub, verily by the remembrance of Allah, the hearts are quieted. That this refers to praying on the Prophet, because it is a form of dhikr. And the prayer on the Prophet والسلام, is a dhikr that is for all Muslims. It's not something that's like specific for one type of Muslim or one type of tariqah or something like that. It's for all of us because we are all the people of Muhammad. So it's the universal you know, remembrance. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. There okay, was something question, online? Yeah. What ways is Prophet's death a mercy? Well, the there's a continuation of that hadith that the Prophet's death is a, is a passing, is a mercy. First of all, out of respect, we don't say death. But we say, intaqala ila rafiq al-a'la, that the Prophet Sallallahu moved to the highest level of paradise. And I know this might sound like semantics, but anything that agitates extremists we hold on to it uh, with our molar teeth <clears throat> so they get agitated because they want to act like the prophet is dead like you know they go like this he's like he's dead or he's gone and i'm here well no he's not gone and he's alive in his grave as the hadith indicate all of the prophets are alive in their graves and also there's another reason i say that because and i say this every time we have a janaza prayer is that death for us is, is not the end of life. It's moving from one mode of living to another mode of living. People that think that death is the end, that's a very material way of thinking, and that's not our belief. Our belief is not that at all. But that death is moving from one mode of living to another. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he said, that people are asleep, and when they die, they wake up. Because when you die, you're like, oh, you, you realize that what we're saying is actually true. Anyway. Uh, the, the, the continuation of the hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu said, my life is better for you, or in another narration, my life is better for you, you have questions, you come and you ask me and I answer, and my death is better for you because your uh, actions are presented to me every week, and when I find good, I praise Allah, and when I find bad, I ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive you. This is a, a sahih hadith. 
So therefore, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intercedes on our behalf every week. When he's, because, you know, obviously our, the tray of deeds that's presented to the Prophet sucks right now, right? When he's presented with all of our nonsense. So the Prophet makes dua and intercedes on our behalf. That's the, the meaning of the, or one of the meanings of the hadith. And it's, he didn't quote the whole one. I think he'll quote it later in the book. There's another question. It says, uh, can you say more about all links will be severed except the links to the Prophet? All so uh, what's our link? You know, why are we here? What this is our link is the Prophet. The way we pray, the way we fast, the way we do Umrah and Hajj. All our religious life is basically following and imitating the Prophet. Look how diverse we are in this room. What brings us all together? It's the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So Yom al Qiyamah, when people are lost, they're going to be looking for the flags that they followed in this world. All of the isms, all of the slogans, right? We're not going to be lost because we know where to go. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul, we'll all be there. There'll be big trays of biryani and we'll be eating and we'll have water to drink and we'll be in the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. And everyone else is going to be freaking out because all of those slogans that they follow in this world, those flags are not going to be planted yom al-qiyamah. They're going to be lost. That's what it means. So what's our link, right? Our, our, what's our, who's our, what, what slogan, what, what flag do we, do we gather under? We gather under the flag of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And all of us are diverse. Underneath that flag is all the diversity that Islam is able to bring together. This doesn't, uh, I'm not saying like it's monolithic. Of course there are differences. We understand that. Sunni and Shia and and all of these, we understand that there are differences, but we all follow that one flag. We all follow la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And that's our link. And that's why, you know, we're so blessed to have, not only are we blessed to have the book that Qadi Ayad wrote, but we're even more blessed that we have a, you know, very compatible English translation so we can remember, you know, this link and be linked to that. That's what it means. So may this, inshallah, be a link for all of us uh, back to the Prophet Wasallam, because that's the flag we want to find Yom Al-Qiyamah. Was there anything else? Yeah. I don't want to get into a broader discussion, which I feel like you're kind of hinting at. Um, I'm not hinting at anything. I'm very, very that I'm Which doing. is uh, what constitutes other towards the Prophet Sallallahu because I'm kind of thinking of an incident which you might have actually heard in the news um, of a certain professor in some random university. They showed a picture, like a portrait of the Prophet Sallallahu and she got fired from that because a lot of students were saying, you know, this is um, Islamophobic and insulting to us. And I was kind of disappointed in some of the Muslim reactions because there's a certain um, Muslim ac academic, which I will not mention his name, but I have a feeling you might know this person, um, who says, in solidarity of this person, I'm going to show these images as well towards the Prophet Sallallahu And I kind of just wanted you to maybe co comment on that sort of, because, I mean, we're going to get to this eventually in the Shifa, but... Well, I don't know the details. I was consulted about that uh, incident. I don't know the details of the university or the professor, or so I can't speak to the specifics about the person was fired, but the images that were shown are our images. They come from our history, from our art history. And if you look at the, the Persian Islamic art that have figures, all of the figures look the same. Like all the men, they all they all have, they're all the same. And the point of the drawings is not to draw an individual. It's to say this is a, this figure here, and the and the face of the Prophet is usually covered, and there's light emanating. Is to represent the Prophet. No different than me pointing to that and saying this is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's a representation, and it was done with respect, and the Muslims accepted that. Uh, those are the same images I studied when we studied Islamic art. So I was surprised to, to, to almost offended that somebody would say that that's Islamic pho Islamophobia because in a teaching context, I don't see what's Islamophobic about that if that, those are images that come from our tradition. And as I said, the Islamic tradition is diverse. Now, in the Arab world, we don't have those type of drawings. This is more in the Persian world, but it's still part of our broader Islamic tradition. So, uh, 
look, I only want to live by one flag. So I'm not going to do anything within solidarity. With, I, my flag is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul. My job is to teach Islam best as, as, as I was taught it, teach it to you as best as I can, and to get people excited about Islam and about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm not going to next khutbah have a PowerPoint presentation of all of these figurines. I don't need to stand in solidarity. We, we, we have enough you know, internal things. So I don't know who that professor is. I didn't follow that. But there's nothing wrong with those figurines from the point of view, as I, as I stated, if you understand that they're all generic. Uh, and in the Shia world, there is less uh, prohibition on the portrayal of prophets and uh, sahaba in the Sunni world, it's not accepted. So we would not have a physical portrayal. That being said, um, it was very funny because when I was preparing for this, uh, I think I mentioned this in the introductory class, but Al-Jabarti was an Egyptian uh, historian who lived during the French invasion. And uh, when Napoleon came, which is, you know, hilarious, uh, you know, comma, Napoleon was a very comical figure, I, I find. I mean, if you read about what he did, you know, he tried to, he, he came and he claimed in Arabic and he's broken Arabic that he's there to liberate people. I think he called himself Mohammed Napoleon or something like that. It was very, very comical. Anyway, um, Napoleon brought all of these scholars and, and uh, manuscripts and engineers and, and the time that Napoleon was in Egypt, he actually commissioned the chronicling of, of their journey in Egypt. And the description of Egypt that was produced, um, which is a very rare, if anyone wants to get me a gift, it's like a million dollars, but if anyone wants to give me a gift, I would appreciate an original copy of, of that. Maybe next fundraising we can raise money from, anyway. But I saw one original copy in the Princeton Library when I was a student there. So Jabarti says one of the things is that those scholars and engineers, they set up shop, like in, I can't remember, I think it was the Azhar Mosque or some like main mosque downtown, and they were like open. So Jabarti said, I went to go see what that was all about. And he said, I found a translation of the Shifa in French. And I also found that they had pictures and drawings of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, and Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali and stuff like that. I mean, he didn't, you know, take out a bazooka and blow them up or blow himself up or anything like that. He's just like, these people are so <laughs> stupid and idiotic. I mean, that's not what the Prophet looked like, alayhi salatu salam. So we have tolerated these type of things in the past. Heraclius, the Roman emperor, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent, uh, I think it was Dihya al-Kalbi, radiallahu the sahabi, to, to, with his message, Heraclius pulled out of this box, this chest, he says, do you know who this is? This is uh, Abraham. So he's, do you know who this is? And Dihya said, oh my God, that's the Prophet. He said, this looks like the Prophet. So he's like, this is your Prophet. I said, this is Muhammad. So he, we have these stories. And I'm not saying that it's, we're going to draw the Prophet and we're going to hang his picture. That's, we can't, that's haram. But we've, we've had these experiences in the past, going back to the time of the Prophet and we've tolerated that. But our respect of the Prophet is this way, is to learn about his character traits and to uh, follow his traditions and to take his character traits as our own character traits. That's how we honor him. We don't need to make a bust of the Prophet and just put it in the corner of the mosque and forget about it. So that's what I think about that stuff. Sorry if I kind of no, no, meandered. In the... <laughs> Anybody else? وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون